And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Whew. Great job. Great job. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13, it says, Then they brought little children to him, that he may touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as little children will by no way, no means enter it. This morning, we're going to look at some alarming statistics. Uh, I've been encouraging those with children or grandchildren or who are going to be parents one day that this is a message you definitely need to hear. And I hope this will help us see just how vital our youth and our children's ministries are. For a number of years, serving as a youth pastor, every church I ever went into, I'd hear parents and youth and leaders there say, oh, we have got a grounded group of young people. Oh, man, you're, you're going to find that our young people, they, they, they know the Word of God. And I would get in this church each time and discover the majority of them did not even know the simplest of Bible stories. And this was church after church after church. And the problem is, for too many years, we've been focusing on playing games. And look, everybody tell you, I, I love to have a good time. I love to pick. I love to play. But when it comes to God's Word, this is serious business. We need to make sure that we're instilling godly values, that we're instilling the Word of God in our children. That our, our children's ministries and our youth ministries have just as much, if not more, focus placed upon them than any other ministry in the church because this is our future. And you're going to see just how devastating the effects of us many times not putting the focus that we need to on our children today. Again, there's going to be a lot of statistics in this. If anybody wants any of these numbers after, I, after we're done, I'll be glad to make copies of this. Most of this, a lot of this came from the Centers for Disease Control as well as other government agencies. Children and teens and church. Seven, I want you to listen real close to all of these, seven out of ten parents claim they are effectively developing the spiritual maturity of their children. But a Barna research survey among eight to twelve year olds discovered that only one third of them said that church has made a positive difference in their lives. One third contend that prayer is very important in their life, but most admit that they would rather be popular than to do what is right. Majority of our church kids say they would rather be popular than to do what they know is morally right. According to another poll by the Barna Group, children and teens rank, and I want you to get this, as the most spiritually active demographic in America. Children and teens are the most spiritually active demographic in America. That means that they're more spiritually active than our adults, young adults, medium range adults, and senior adults. Our children and youth are more spiritually active because they're usually involved in some type of church, youth group, or other activities. Regardless of whether or not they show it in the church, our children and youth are hungering for the truth during these formidable years. Our kids are being attacked at school with all kind of false doctrines and all kind of false beliefs. Our children are looking for the truth and they're looking to us, they're looking to the church, they're looking to parents and grandparents to give them that truth that they are so desperately searching for. Teenagers are more likely than their parents, according to this same study, to attend church, but are less likely to pray or read their Bibles. This is not surprising considering that one-third of teens said that the biggest reason they attend church is to spend time with friends. It's not about coming to church to learn a lot of times about God. They come to do fun stuff. I know as a youth minister, I, I put a survey out amongst a lot of our teens one time. Every church I ever went into, immediately following me arriving, I would do a survey to kind of figure out where the teens were at. And I said, what would you like to see in our youth group? 
majority of it was going to be less Bible and more fun stuff. That's where the focus was at. They were focused on coming and seeing friends. Not so much on God's Word. When asked, only 45% of church-going teens said that making a spiritual connection with God at church was important to them. Only 45%. Now, I was talking about youth and children being the most active demographic. Yes, they're at church, but they're not being fed. They're at church, but their focus is not on God. Again, 45% of church-going teens said that making a spiritual connection with God at church was not important to, him, important to them. A majority, 3 to 1, of teenagers prefer churches with teachings relevant to their daily lives than those that teach the background of the faith. Now, I'll tell you, the background of our faith is very important. But if we're not teaching life application when they get out into the real world, it's doing absolutely no good. It's the same with our adults. I try as a pastor when I preach, I try to give life application so you'll know how to take it and make application in your life. If not, I'm not benefiting you in any kind of way. I'm just up here rambling. A teacher in a class is the same way. If you're not giving these kids something that they can take to school with them, take home with them, and make application, we're wasting our time. We need to make sure that it's relevant to what they're dealing with in life. That is why children's church is one of the things that's so important. I fought this battle for years, over 15 years in and out of churches, and say, well, we don't need children's church. We just The kids just need to sit in there with us. Why? It's not relevant to them. I had a lady argue with me one time. They did not want children's church in their church. She said, the children need to be sitting in big church. I said, and doing what my children do. I said, I pray with my children. We read Bible stories to our children. But our children were young at the small at the time. I said, you know what they do in church? Color. I have people say, well, we've got quiet packs for the kids so they can color during big church. <laughs> what are they getting out of that? We need something that is relevant to our children. We need things that are relevant to our young people. Again, three to one, teenagers prefer churches that are teaching something that's relevant to their lives that they can take back to school and they can fight the daily battles. We move from children and teens to those that are getting into college and young adults. We need to face some cold hard facts. Our children and youth will soon, sooner than we want to realize or admit, will be going into college. The children's statistics for college, or excuse me, the Christian statistics for college students and young adults is not pretty. Matter of fact, it's frightening. Most Americans have a period of time during their teen years when they're actively engaged in a church. However, Barna's tracking of young people show that most of them had become completely, not partially, completely disengaged from organized religion by the time they had reached their 20s. It means we lose the majority of our young people when they hit 20. Charles Spurgeon said that the church is one generation away from disappearing. Folks, we're in that generation. We're one generation from the church completely disappearing from this earth if we do not do something now. We need to figure out what happens or doesn't happen in the church between the ages of 8 and 21 that results in a lack of interest by our young adults. 60% of 20-somethings say they were once actively involved in church as a teenager and a child, but are no longer. 60% say that at one time they were in church, but now they have no active, active life in church at all. Only 20% of young adults maintain the same level of spiritual activity during their 20s that they did in their childhood and teen years. I repeat, only 20% of the children that are in our church today will still be spiritually active when they become an adult at the age of 20. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me. We've got to make sure we do something. As a matter of fact, for most young adults, their spiritual activity occurs outside of the church body. People in their 20s feel less likely to be committed to a congregation. 
There's something that takes place that causes them to disconnect from a congregation and not want to get back involved. They'll get involved and maybe have a little prayer group somewhere or they'll find some friends that have, have some type of beliefs. That's the reason we have so many young people that are going off into some type of false doctrine. Do you know that the Southern Baptist Convention, we have more people go into cults out of our denomination than any other denomination there is. I repeat, we have more young people and children go into cults than any other denomination. And do you want to know why? We're not discipling. We're not teaching. We're not training. See, we've got to do more than just tell Bible stories. We've got to teach our children the doctrinal truths of God's Word. It is usually not until they have kids that 20-somethings ever return to church and then it's driven by an interest of providing some type of spiritual guidance to their children. That was me. I had no connection until I was almost 30 years old and it was because I was concerned about my children. I wanted to get them involved in church. See, it's not until we get on into our 20s and we start having children and we start worrying about what's going to happen to them that we start trying to reconnect with God again. Despite these numbers, a whopping 78% of young adults claim to be Christians. Yet, for a vast majority of them, their spiritual beliefs in very few ways align with biblical teachings. 78% say that they're Christians. You walk into most any bar or any place, how many Christians? Most of the hands are going to go up. Everybody believes they're Christian because Grandma was baptized at Rusty Nail Baptist Church back in the 30s. And, I, and I'm a Christian by proxy. Or I heard about Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I had a grandfather, and like I said, uh, cuss words come out of his mouth every breath. I, if I heard GD once a day, I heard it a couple of dozen times a day. But every time he was going in for surgery, he'd tell you, I'm all right with God. I'm good. I know I'm a Christian. I'm a member of uh, Macedonia Baptist Church. Now, I had never seen him in that church. And only, well, let me back up. I lied twice when they buried his mom and his daddy out in the cemetery. There at the church, we attended the church. I wouldn't have even known Macedonia existed. I thought it was some mythical place. My grandfather talked about it a lot, but I never did know he ever, ever see the church. Or never knew he went there. He would tell me about it. I'm on a roll at Macedonia Baptist Church. I wanted to find this church just to find out. We've got a lot of people that believe that today. Again, 78% of young people claim to be Christians, but their spiritual beliefs do not line up with God's Word. How serious is this? In our denominations, please don't miss this, in our denomination, 88% of children raised in Southern Baptist Church families leave church at the age of 18 and never return. 88% of our young people leave church at the age of 18 and they never come back. And we wonder why our churches are declining today. According to Barna Research, 64% of decisions for Christ are made before the age of 18. 77% are made before the age of 21. Basically meaning, if we don't reach them when they're young, we're not going to reach them. After they're adults, man, it starts going downhill fast. The odds of you reaching someone with the gospel. If we don't get them when they're young, the world's gotten a hold of them and we're going to lose them. We're losing this generation. Only an estimated, don't miss this, only an estimated 4% of the Bridger generation, that's these small ones here, 44% of the Bridger generation or the Gen Y generation will be believing Christians when they reach adulthood. For their grandparents' generation, it was 65%. Their parents' generation, it was 35%. And now for this generation of kids, 4%. 4%. How close are we to losing this generation? How close are we to the church disappearing from the face of the earth? Only 4%. We can't decline much more if we're already losing 4%. Or all but 4%. 
We can't sit back and watch his generation be stolen from our own churches and our own homes. We must take action and we must do it before they reach the pivotal age of 18 and make decisions that will affect the rest of their lives. Now this is possibly because of another result from a Barna survey. Although a large majority of the public claim to be deeply spiritual and say that their religious faith is important to them, only 15%, 15%, not of the population, not 15% of the lost world, 15% of the church, on, that those who regularly, not, not, not our Easter and Christmas only, those who regularly attend church services, out of that group, only 15% ranked their relationship with God as a top priority in their life. Only 15% of people who attend church on a regular basis said that their relationship with God was a priority. If it's not a priority to the adults and to the parents, I promise you it's not going to be a priority to the kids. Can't tell you how many times I had mamas bringing kids in to me and said, Brother Hort, you need to talk to this one. He's gotten in trouble at school. He's gotten kicked out of school. He's had this. He got caught with drugs. He got caught with this. He got caught with that. You need to do something with him. And I'm sitting there looking at her going, and you are, I'm his mother. Oh, well, we've never met. Let me introduce myself. And they wonder why little Tommy's getting in all of this trouble. I had a mom who was one of these that was actively involved in the church. Her oldest son had gotten caught up in drugs and alcohol. Her, daughter, her, her next oldest, her middle daughter, was kicked out of band and got in all trouble, kind of trouble at school because of the fact that she was shoplifting and drugs and alcohol. The other daughter was uh, in and out of trouble with stuff. Twelve years old, she was having problems with this daughter. Mom was never home. Mom was never taking care. Mom was never instilling anything in this child. She brought her to me and said, I need you to fix her. <coughs> I said, uh, that's not in my job qualifications. I don't know how to fix your child. I'll sit down and talk with you. And we sit down and I talk with the child and then I talk with mom. And you know what I discovered? The child said, I'm just left to fend for myself most of the time. Mom's never there. So I sit down with mom and I said, mom, your daughter's spiritual life ought to be the most important thing in the world to you. You need to instill in your child. You need to quit some of your extracurricular activities. You want to know how to fix this? You need to invest in your child. Mom did that for about a week, and then she come back, and I quote, and this was a lady actively involved in my church, looked at me and said, uh, I've got a life of my own, and I don't have time to be a warden. Now, I could give you a list of things that this child's gotten into since. But my, the blame lays with mom. Again, the majority, 15% of those who regularly attend church say that their relationship with God is not a top priority. If it's not a top priority for you and I, how can we expect it to be a top priority for our children? Now, what are the immediate effects of those not attending church? 2012 National Survey on Drug Use and Health now these are average monthly alcohol use statistics. Average monthly alcohol use statistics. Among 12 to 13 year olds, 2.2% of the population are using alcohol. 2.2% per month are drinking alcohol. 12 to 13. Look around your 12 to 13 year olds. Now I had somebody tell me the other day, that's not possible. I said, you want to know when I started drinking? I was 12. Yeah, it's possible. Among 14 to 15 year olds, 11.1% were alcohol users this past month. 5.4% were binge alcohol users and 0.6% were heavy alcohol users. Among 16 to 7 year olds, 24.8% were alcohol users this past month. 15% were binge alcohol users, and 3.1% were heavy alcohol users. Among 18 to 20 year olds, 
45. It jumps to 45.8% used alcohol this last month. Now I want to point out some. 18 to 20 is still illegal. But 45% of them got alcohol. 45% were alcohol users. 30.5% were binge alcohol users. And 10%... 10% were heavy alcohol users this past month. Among 21 to 25 year olds, it jumps to 69.2%. 45% were binge and 14% were heavy alcohol users. According to the CDC, although drinking by persons under the age of 21 is illegal, do not miss this, please. Although drinking by persons under the age of 21 is illegal, youth ages 12 to 20 years old drink 11% of all alcohol consumed in the United States. CDC statistics, now these aren't mine. Children 18 to 20 drink 11% of all alcohol consumed in the United States. More than 90% of this alcohol is consumed in binge drinking. On average, on average, underage drinkers consume more alcohol per drinking occasion than adult drinkers do. Per occasion, children drink more than the adults. In 2010, there were approximately 189,000 emergency room visits by persons under the age of 21 for injuries and other conditions linked to alcohol use. In a 2011 CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey, they found that among high school students during the past 30 days, 39% drank some alcohol, 22 were binge drinkers, 8%, 8% drove under the influence. 8% of our nation's children last month more than likely were driving under the influence of alcohol and 24% got in a car and rode with somebody who was drinking. And we wonder why we're seeing so many of our young people killed in alcohol related accidents. Two thousand and twelve National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Now these I've covered alcohol. These are the average monthly statistics for illicit drug use among twelve to thirteen year olds. The prevalence of monthly illicit drug use was three point five percent of our twelve year olds and thirteen year olds were using drugs. Among 14 to 15 year olds, the prevalence of monthly illicit drug use was 8.2%. Among 16 to 7 year, year olds, it jumps to 16.6%. Among 18 to 20 year olds, the prevalence of mo monthly illicit drug use was 23.9%. Uh, Among 21 to 25 year olds, it drops back down to 19.7%. In 2008, the percentage of 12th grade adolescents who have used any illicit drug except marijuana in the past month was about 25%. Understand, 25% of our young people had used an illicit drug, not marijuana, as bad as that is, had used a heavy drug in the last 30 days. As of 2010, about 30% of 10th graders use marijuana in the past year. More than two-thirds of 10th graders say they could easily gain access to any of these drugs. In 2010, 3% of 12th graders had used cocaine. In the past year, 8% had used the opiate Vicodin, 5% used inhalants, and five, nearly 5% had used ecstasy. Now, I don't know how much you know about ecstasy, but this is bad news. I've dealt with ecstasy addicts. 
5% of our 12th graders each year are using ecstasy. And about 1.5% per year are using anabolic steroids. We see the road it's leading our kids down. Addiction, ruining their lives, but also death. According to the CDC, suicide is the third leading cause of death among teenagers. Anybody that's heard me in the past, regularly on the past few, over the past few months, you've heard me give a statistic on teen suicide, and I want to apologize, I gave you a bad statistic. I told you that suicide was the second leading cause of death among teenagers, and it used to be. It's no longer the second leading cause of death among teenagers. Suicide is now number three. Accidents, everybody always wants to know number one. Number one's accidents. But now suicide's number three now. That would be good news, except for what just moved into the number two spot. And I never would have figured it. The second leading cause of death among teenagers today is homicide. They're not just killing themselves, now they're killing each other. And a lot of it's connected back here to the drugs and to the alcohol. <clears throat> How do we reach this generation before it's too late? God's given us the prescription for it in His Word. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're beginning with verse 1. It says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless before your eye, between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. He's laid it out very clearly as a church, as parents, as grandparents. And oh yes, our responsibility does not stop with our children. He said so that you and your children and your grandchildren, I'm responsible for at least three generations. I'm responsible for my children, but I'm responsible for their children too. You, your children, and your children's children. How do we reach this generation? Quickly. Five things. First of all, he says, learn God's Word. You can't teach it if you don't know it. You need to learn God's Word. You need to spend time in God's Word. You need to meditate on God's Word. You don't need to just glance over it. It needs to be in your heart. You need to be studying it each day. You need to learn God's Word. Secondly, you need to live God's Word. I promise you, if you're preaching it, you better be living it. Because your children and grandchildren are not going to follow your words. They're going to follow your actions. Plain and simple. David, his last command to Solomon was, live before God all your life. You know, live for Him. Put Him first. What did he do? He went chasing women just like his daddy did. He did not follow God. He followed his daddy's ways. He did not follow his daddy's words. He followed his actions. 
You need to learn God's Word. You need to live God's Word. You need to love God and His Word. There need, you need to have that love in your life. Your children, your grandchildren, the children at church need to see that in us. They need to see a love that's here for one another, a love for our family. And that love is committed through sacrifice for our families. We need to learn. We need to live. We need to love. And then we need to teach God's Word. We need to be teaching our children, looking for those teachable moments. He said, teach them as you're going down the road. Teach them as you sit down at home, when you sit, when you lay, whenever you're walking, look for those teachable moments. We're to train up. You go back and you, it says, train up a child in the way of the Lord. You've got to train them. You've got to teach them. You've got to show them. You do it at home, but also we have a responsibility here at the church. Now, how many here besides myself are glad to see all the kids we've been seeing coming into church? Amen. Do you feel like that they've been led here by God, that they're a gift from God? I, I do. And folks, we need to be teaching them. Now, the reason I say this, I'm fixing to make a big push. We need some help with our children. Andy needs help with the youth. We need help in children's church. We should not have to beg people to come and to teach and to help. And we need to do more than just go through the motions with it. We need to invest in our kids. We need to invest in these student ministries because this is our next generation. And folks, statistics are right here. If we don't start investing in them, guess what? The world's ready to invest in them and the world is stealing our kids out of our church. <coughs> it's time we start investing in our kids that we save these kids. And we do that by investing our time into them. Which means, if you're a Sunday school teacher, your lesson, you need to have it prepared. Don't walk in there and throw something together because it's a bunch of kids. Have it ready. Invest the time in teaching these children. Don't wait for them. You know, everybody, I'm going to take up for my youth minister back here. I love Andy and I love his heart for these kids. Don't wait and, say, and wonder, well, Andy, why can't you hang on to these kids when we didn't train them up to begin with? Statistics already shows this is happening all over the country. I've been on that end of it when I was trying to train up kids and teach them the basics when they should have learned them when they were in first, second, third grade. We haven't invested in our children. And now we're reaping benefits from it as a nation. We're watching our nation fall apart. Our kids are facing things today that we can't even begin to imagine. Church, it's time to invest. We need to learn God's Word. We need to live God's Word. We need to love God and His Word. We need to teach God's Word. And lastly, we need to love these kids. And we show that we love these kids by investing in these kids. I want every child in here to stand up. If you're a youth, young adult, and all the children, please stand. Sit down. <laughs> I'm talking to Rob. I'm sorry. I want all these children to stand up. Y'all stand up. Y'all are young adults. Ronnie, you're a young adult. Stand up. Why don't you look around here? According to, to the statistics, we're going to lose all but just a couple of these kids. Not on my watch. Folks, it's time we invest in these young people.